This channel is part of the History Hit Network. About six months ago, a Somerset businessman here in the village of Lopen decided to build himself a new driveway. But when he dug down here, he discovered this. It's Roman, it's late 4th century, and experts reckon it's one of the 10 best Roman mosaics ever found in Britain. It's a fantastic find, a great story, and it could be about to get even better. Because a mile down the road, the owners of this field reckon they've found something pretty special too. When they heard about the find in Lopen, they decided to dig a bit deeper. And not to be outdone by their neighbours, they uncovered this which I'm told is even finer mosaic work than the one in Lopen. But how much of it has survived? And what about the buildings that these mosaics were part of? How lavish were they? Who built them? And where did the money come from? Time Team have been invited in to solve the mystery of Somerset's secret Roman villas. And we've got just three days to do it. The hunt for Dinnington's Roman villa starts here, in the field where that tantalising fragment of Roman mosaic was discovered. The woman who found it was farmer's daughter Trudy Ridger. My husband humoured me. I said, I'm going to go and dig a hole. And I came down my spade and I dug here. And as I started to get down into the, um, into the topsoil, I was only down about four inches or so and I was finding more and more bits of tessery. And I was thinking, there's definitely something here. And I was just getting more and more excited. And then I thought, I'd better not do anything else. Got the local archaeologist in, because I didn't want to do any damage. He scratched around in the bottom of the hole. There were the pieces of tessery in situ, which was just so exciting. History Hit is an award-winning streaming platform built by history fans for history fans. History Hit is your one-stop shop for quality ancient history documentaries, with exclusive videos about our ancestors from ancient Britain to the hidden secrets of Karnak. There's something for everyone. We also aim to bring you the stories and legends that shaped our world through our award-winning podcast network. Sign up now for a free trial and Odyssey fans get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use the code ODYSSEY at checkout. So, fortified by a drop of Christmas spirit, Trudy wrote a letter asking us to find out how much of the villa survives in her field. Uh, Neil, we've got a piece of mosaic the size of a quarter of a pound of cheese and a few surface finds. It's not much to go on, is it? Oh, it is. Look at this. This is an aerial photograph mm. taken in the 1970s. And can you see these dark splodges? These are surely the actual remains of yeah. the wings of a large building. Wow. I think you can see it better if, you, if I lay this on top. You see that? So it looks like we've almost got three ranges around a central courtyard. Does that say villa to you? Oh, definitely. It looks like something we call a wing corridor villa, but the real thing is it's about 150 metres across. Now, even the fastest man in the world is going to take about 15 seconds to run through that. So that's a, that's a stately home-sized building. It's a really substantial building. It's more than substantial. It's absolutely massive. And we've only got three days to dig. So what's Neil's plan? To start with, we're going to dig a series of very small holes, test pits in our jargon, maybe only about literally not much more than the big size of this bonnet. Mm. And the reason for this is it's very, very important that we go down very carefully through the plough soil onto the very latest deposits. There might be things above that mosaic that we haven't seen so far. With such a huge area to cover, Neil reckons his test pits will give us a snapshot of the archaeology before we decide where to put our larger trenches. It's not the way we normally do things, and our diggers are itching to get to work. David was saying he wants a big trench. Big trench? <laughs> well, something about three times bigger than this. But Neil's the boss, so we're going to do things his way. We'll be putting one of the test pits in the area where Trudy found her mosaic. The others will be dictated by the geophys of the West Range. 
which is looking pretty spectacular. What I think we've got is a big range coming down here, possibly 20 metres wide. There appears to be a corridor on this side and a whole series of rooms coming off. Now, if we look at the results, the red is showing the wall foundations. We appear to have these rooms here and this big corridor coming down, this being the full range. Well, that would make sense, wouldn't it? I mean, it's a, it's a classic villa arrangement. And what it does do is it tells us how to put the test pits. Because I think, basically, one there, one there, one there, one there, one there, and perhaps one into the corridor, i.e. One, one on the floor of each room. So our first test pits are targeting a series of rooms in the west wing of the villa, including the area where Trudy's mosaic turned up last year. If those mosaics are anything to go by, this area should contain some of the villa's grandest rooms. Although we don't know how well they'll have survived the centuries of ploughing that must have taken place here. But we're about to find out, because within minutes of starting to dig the test pits, Phil's uncovered a mosaic. There it is. Ooh. Who needs geophysics? <laughs> Isn't it amazing how that can just survive, you know, that near the surface? Mm. With Phil digging through it as well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, you know, that is really... That is still incredibly compacted when you consider just how close that is to the bottom of the, of the plough soil. When did you last dig a mosaic, Phil? To be quite honest, I don't know that I ever have. Not a nice one like this, anyway. Very is ever. Let's hope Phil's mosaic is as nice as the fragment that turned up here last year. David, what is it about this piece of mosaic which makes you say it's an exceptionally fine piece of work? Well, because the tessery are so fine. Notice these are about five millimetres across. Do you think this is a figure? It's almost certainly a human head. This is the temple. These black lines represent hair, and this row, curved row, represents the eye. This fine-figured mosaic dates from around the 4th century, so whoever was living at the villa then wasn't short of a bob or two. Oh, Neil, I've got the pattern bit. Oh, yeah, look at that. There's the red bits. Yeah, which is tile. Play tile. And then the, and then the white oh, bits. Oh, nice. Isn't that something mm -hmm. else? That's good, isn't it? Oh, we, we, we got to see more of this, haven't we? Now that we know how deep the mosaic is, Phil's expanding his test pit to form Trench 1. As well as mosaics, Trudy's come across a lot of other Roman finds in the field. Most of this is 3rd and 4th century, but some of the coins suggest activity on the site in the very early years of Roman Britain. Now, that's Nero. Incredibly decadent emperor, but it's a yeah. brilliant portrait. This coin was struck between 64 and 68. It's hardly seen anywhere at all. This coin's been lost probably within a few, four or five years at the most of it being struck, so that takes us right back to the first century. Right. And there's also um, this prehistoric coin here, this local oh, tribal coin. Stator? Yeah, that's right, of the Durotrigus tribe. So that doesn't really fit, does it, with a lot of the other coins, which are mostly third and fourth century. I suppose then, just to complete the picture, we've got the key, perhaps the front door key to the Roman house. Yeah. And the Again, iron shaft is rusted away. away. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We've got a real mixture, haven't we? Yeah, total, yeah. Mm. But no early pottery. No. Just got those tantalising coins. In the villa's west wing, the archaeologists are still beavering away in Neil's test pits. But at least we've got one proper trench opened. Phil, is this lovely or what? It's quite amazing, Tony, isn't it, really? I mean, it's very, very badly damaged, but already we can actually begin to see the pattern. You see, it's alternate checkerboard of grey and red squares. And what we're actually in is in a corridor, and it's running this way. It's going right back past where Kerry's digging, isn't That's it? That's right. It's, it's extending all the way up there. And where Alan is here is one wall of the corridor. That's in there. So beyond that is the yard, and then in here, we're going to be into the rooms of the wing of the, of the villa. That's great, but it isn't actually test pits, is it? No, it's not, but it's legitimate, because what we actually did, we demonstrated that there was nothing above the mosaic before yeah. we actually got the machine in. But here, 
Look, demolition rubble starting to sit down a and a floor. And now, look at this. Ah! A mosaic. Oh, fantastic. Yes. On here day one. Oh, On no. day one. Ah, oh, here we have a flower pattern. And that looks much finer than the mosaic in the upper trench, doesn't it? Well, it's much finer. Look at that. Yeah. Trudy, look at this. Oh, my goodness. Oh, I knew it was there. <laughs> oh, it's so excellent. I knew it. I knew it. If I brush this, give you some idea of the, the pattern that's emerging. Here you see some of these spirals, which I was explaining. You notice this little crest. And here the pattern continues, we hope. It's breathtaking. It's absolutely breathtaking. We've got to see more of this new mosaic too. So we're opening our second trench here in the villa's west wing. The mosaics we're uncovering tell us there was a really grand building here in the 4th century. This was a period of real prosperity in Roman Britain, with fabulously wealthy landowners ploughing their money into grand houses like ours at Dinnington. And there are lots of other villa sites in this part of Somerset, which was the breadbasket of Roman Britain. But ours is starting to look like one of the biggest of the lot. I think we've got to get a handle on sure. how our place compares to other villas and whether we can get any clues about where to go here. That's our aerial sure. photograph, but I've printed out some plans of other villas from Britain on the same scale. This is Bignor in Sussex, one of the biggest and best known Romano British villas, but look how it compares. Because, yeah, we think of Bignor as such a big villa, but in yeah. fact, ours is bigger again, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Now, Bignor's particularly interesting because there is the original house at Bignor that grew out into these wings, and I wonder if the place we've got here is the same sort of thing, sure. growing out from the middle. Because that happens, doesn't it? From right. a fairly humble start, you then tack on your expensive new extension over here. And, you know, yeah. These things do grow organically over, what, 200 years or That's so. Right. So our villa might all have been built in the fourth century by a rich newcomer to the area, or it might have grown out of a more humble earlier building, a sort of status symbol for a local boy made good. Neil thinks the best chance of finding an earlier building is here, in the North Range, where Geofiz have extended their survey. What we want to do is look for the range of buildings on this side that we've now got in the geophysics. Now we actually want to put the test pit in here. This is the south-facing range, looking out up the, up the valley. So it's possible this could be actually the early core to the building. But I'm keen to go down in this structure a bit and find out when, when this building start. But wouldn't it be better doing that by digging fewer holes and more considered trenches? No, because I think what you're getting with the test pitting is you're actually getting wider coverage. So we're actually looking in different rooms. We're, we're assessing each room on its merits. We're not saying so we're... It's pure coincidence that we're expanding the trenches when we find a mosaic then. That's not, no, it's not like that at all. What we're actually doing is we're expanding the trenches when we know what we've got. Just revealing the actual mosaic is incredibly satisfying and a real privilege, but you keep getting really interesting added presents. Look, this is lovely. This piece of plaster, and you see it's got these grooves in it. They're actually where the plaster whacked onto the wattle of the wall, so it shows that the walls themselves were actually made of wattle. but the mosaic's best. The more we uncover of this place, the better it starts to look. Lovely pieces of painted wall plaster. That's right, and normally, of course, we only get pieces this sort of size yeah. surviving, but here we've got a real number of very large pieces. Really big pieces. And there are more pieces down in there. And are these more pieces here? We've actually got this other painted plaster as well, not from this trench, this is from Kerry's trench. Lovely. But it sort of adds to the picture, you know, you could perhaps mm. see the red sort of base rim running around the bottom of the wall, Pompeii red, and then higher up you've got this highly, more highly decorated plaster there, yeah. and it's beautiful. Have you got anything else from out this trench? One particular piece I wanted to show you. Um, it's, oh, I think it's glass. That's lovely, yeah. yeah. Roman glass Roman bead. Roman green glass bead, that's beautiful. So beautiful, isn't it? I really that's like things fine. like that. So what's the plan for this trench now? Um, I think 
what we've, well, the decision we've come to is that because we've got so much of this um, painted plaster here, we've decided it's got to be associated with a wall. Yeah. So, and because, because of the position it was in the ground, sort of face yeah. up, it suggests to me that in fact so it's, it's fallen off the wall. It's all sort of slipped down yeah. the wall. Um, so, bearing that in mind, we've decided to extend the trench another metre this way. And we might be able to find the wall here, yeah. and it might be the wall which is associated with the mosaic, the mosaic room over there, or it's an entirely different room. So David's test pit becomes trench three. Amazing day. Not every day you get something like this, and I think in most archaeologists' career this is a, a red letter day. It's obviously absolutely brilliant to find something as, as great as this, but the truth is it doesn't actually tell us where the place came from or how the owner got to the point where he had the time and the money to put this in, and I think that's what we need to find out. You are such a spoil sport. I'd be no, quite I'm happy not. to spend the next two days just clearing away this But don't mosaic. you want to find out how somebody got to this stage in their life? Well, yes, of course I do. How are we going to do that? Well, we're going to have to go down, aren't we? I mean, what we're looking at at the moment is literally eight inches below mm. the surface. You know, we are literally tickling the top of this archaeological site. There could be a lot of deposits underneath this. Yeah. You know, we're looking at a fourth century mosaic, a fourth century house. Now, is this a new creation? Is this new money? Or is it developing out of someone's ancestor who lived in a much humbler house in the first century, made some money, made some money, made some money? That's actually a crucial question. So, tomorrow we're going to go down to see what the archaeology can tell us about the whole story of this villa. And we'll also be seeing if we can reveal the full extent of this fantastic mosaic. Join us after the break. We came here yesterday looking for evidence of Dinnington's secret Roman villa, and boy did we find it. Down here we've got this exquisite Roman mosaic with this highly patterned area right in the middle, and a lot more of that is going to be revealed during the course of the day, but that isn't all. Over here we've got a second mosaic in white and red checks, the mosaics are all situated in the Grand West Range of the villa, but we've also opened Trench 4 to find out more about the buildings in the North Range. We're all finding it really difficult to tear ourselves away from the mosaics, but this end of the site is just as important, if not more so, because it could hold the key to the whole story of the history of this villa. Why is this area so important? Well, this could be where we think the early house is because you know, it'd be quite common to have a, a house that starts off quite humbly and then develops. You know, they get a bit more money, they build, a, build, a, build an extension on there. A bit more money, they build another wing up there. A bit more money, build another wing up there. So, you know, being the south-facing range could be the key to the early history of the villa. But it's really dirty and confused here. But over there, it's phenomenally clean. Yeah, now that's interesting. And I, we don't really understand that yet, which I think is probably reason to extend the trench. And is John's walls likely to be in here somewhere? Yeah, they should be turning up at the back there if, if we're right. And I think we can just start to see some stonework coming up. So this needs a bit more work, but hopefully we're going to get the main wall of the late villa here. Have we got any dating evidence? Yeah, we found some um, nice early datable uh, samianware. Fantastic. So this, Tony, is a nice little wine cup. And the key to this is it dates to about 200 years earlier than the mosaic that David's been digging up, about 150 AD. So we're going back in time all the time now. While Trench 4's taking us back into the second century, over in the West Range, we're still firmly in the fourth. In Trench 1, Phil's found evidence of a hypercaust, the underfloor heating system for the villa's grand winter dining rooms. He's also uncovered more fragments of the exceptional figured mosaic that would have covered the floor. And we're revealing more of the patterned mosaic in Trench 2. Because it's so near to the surface, it's been badly damaged by the plough in some places. But elsewhere, it's remarkably well preserved. And we're about to find out how big it really is. Why is this part so significant? Well, because we'll find out whether the mosaic is just a simple square panel Mm. or whether it's going to be a multiple of the pattern that you see here. So it could well be three of them. So that's what we'll find out any minute. So we could nearly have finished the job, or it might go on Or it will be three times way. bigger. Yeah. There we go. Ah, oh, there it is. Yeah, there's the turn. There's the turn. So it's just a small panel. 
simple panel. With the money to pay for mosaics like this, you'd think life must have been pretty cushy for the family in our villa. But money didn't always buy security in 4th century Britain. The kind of chap living in this sort of house, he would have probably been one of that top end of local society, perhaps sitting on urban councils, parceling up the local economy for all their advantage, maybe passing laws, that local laws, that kind of thing, getting advanced information about currency changes, all the sort of thing that helps a rich person stay rich and get richer. So your ancestors had it made, really, didn't they? Well, I don't know about that, because the trouble is you're very exposed, aren't you? That top end of society. And there are a whole series of people in Britain and, and across other provinces in the northern part of the empire who try and set themselves up as emperor. There's one not, not very long before the time that the mosaic goes in, a chap called Magnentius. And the empire sends an imperial secretary to get his supporters in Britain. And we actually know from the written sources that this chap, Paul, took away property, seized property off this kind of person if they'd supported the wrong man. So no, it wasn't easy street. You could have all this could disappear overnight. Over in the North Range, Neil wanted to find evidence of the early villa building. And he's got it. These walls were probably built in the first century, at least 200 years before the mosaics were laid. This really is an extensive site, isn't yeah. it? I mean, it's enormous. It's 150 metres across this range. So we're still walking well, over the North Range yeah. here? We're still walking through someone's house. You know, in its late period, this is an enormous country house. Why are we stuck in another little test bit here? This is a little bit of keyhole surgery, which has been dictated by the geophysics. Now that we've identified the earliest villa building, Neil wants to pinpoint the place where the extension was added. As predicted, what this is, surely, is a house, isn't it? An, an individual structure which predates the rest, and the rest is up the extensions added on. So you're putting in this little test bit here to try and work out whether this does join onto that bit yeah. and this separate building. Yeah, if we can prove that that wall is later than that wall, we've cracked it. And if you can't? Back to the drawing board. <laughs> in the incident room, Carenza wants to find out where the raw materials for the villa were sourced and how they were transported back to the site. Stuart and Guy are getting to grips with the landscape story. You see how the villa's actually sat within this nice, nice valley down here? It's a natural bowl, isn't it? It is. Ray Sands gathering information for his computer reconstruction. Yeah. We're coming up to the building now. Right. And then here's the wall along this line. And the 4th century patterned mosaic in Trench 2 is starting to show its true colours. It's just absolutely incredible. It's so, so beautiful. Just can't believe the colours that are coming up, all, all the different greys and different shades of red. And all the hours it must have just taken. It's so vivid. Yeah, lovely, aren't they? Very lovely colours. I actually feel quite emotional seeing how beautiful this is. The lavish interior of our villa shows how affluent this part of Somerset must have been in the 4th century. And running through its heart was one of the motorways of Roman Britain. I mean, the Foss Way is very visually striking, isn't it? It cuts across the countryside. It does, yeah. I mean, one thing that is, is becoming very obvious looking at the maps is how this straight road actually crashes straight through all these field alignments and it looks very much as if these field patterns were essentially here when the Romans arrived. So what, Iron Age? Yeah, oh, yeah. Really? And that the, the Romans are actually basically starting to impose themselves on a the landscape that's already been farmed at the time. Once this road is in the landscape, of course, that would then attract the villas close to it sure. because of the easy access out to the principal towns and settlements along the road system. This is an enormous building, it is, isn't, isn't it? it? Yes. This is one of the biggest in the country. Really? It, it compares to some of the really biggest villas like Big Nor in Sussex or North Lee in Oxfordshire. It's on a par with those. It's up in the sort of top ten almost of largest villas in the country. Wow. A, it is a fantastic discovery. Our five trenches are only scratching the surface of this monumental site. To understand its origins, we need to get much deeper into the archaeology. But that's not happening as quickly as some of the team would like. 
The more this dig goes on, the more we realise we're creating a rod for our own backs. The site's getting bigger and bigger. It stretches way beyond those cars over towards that hedge over there. And we've stretched our resources almost to the limit. Phil, have you got enough people and enough time? Nowhere near enough of either, Tony. Literally not enough. I mean, look, this is one of the trenches we opened up this morning. Look, we haven't even got it cleaned up yet. We've got two experienced diggers in here. Look at the problems of actually just trying to clean it up. With all this rubble here, you just generate so much loose. We've got finders trays all over the place, loads of finds in them, but none of this is coming from stratified context. It's all from just the plough soil and just the cleaning layer. When we started at the beginning of this dig, you said, when was this villa started? The only way we can answer that is to go down. And at the moment, we haven't got the time nor the labor. We're just not going down. This is not just Phil having a moan. We really are on the horns of a dilemma. On one hand, we don't want to stretch ourselves anymore. But on the other hand, John keeps coming up with juicy targets with his geophys. It's all your problem. We're only finding what's here. And oh look at God. this now. Yeah. The same three ranges but look at this coming across here and then in the middle that point there what could it be neil well it could be a gatehouse couldn't it you could have like a perimeter wall to your courtyard with a grand entrance to give you views into your house but we can't just keep putting in trenches can we i mean we we're over halfway through the dig is there any way we can get the most interesting parts of this, but focus in to stop Phil we, from steaming at the ears. But, but we still, we've still got to go down. We've still you, you got, will we, go, we, you we, will, we've got to go down. You can we can't go down. just keep on opening up new areas. No. You can have your way, Phil. No, I'm just, I just trying to, I'm just trying to put forward a rational argument. You, you, you give me the problems. The only way to solve those problems is to go down. Sure. The good news is the other two trenches in the north range are going very well, and I think we'll be able to shut them down in maybe an hour or so, freeing up some diggers, extra labour into here, and let's go down and try and find the origins of this building. Well, that seems reasonable. John, What about you... the gatehouse? <laughs> <laughs> we'll come back to that one later. <laughs> hmm. So we've decided to focus our main efforts on the west range of the villa, where we're going to search for earlier phases of building. The extra labour will come from the north range, where Neil's got exactly what he hoped for in Trench 5. This is the middle range of the villa, and he wanted to know whether the whole of the middle range was built in one phase, or whether there was a discrete central bit that was older than the rest. Have we managed to solve that? We've actually got some very nice black and white archaeology. You've clearly got uh, a corner here with a great hamstone uh, block on it. You've got the older part of the building in that direction and butted up against it, you've got this very poor, later, rubble-filled wall. So that maybe dates to the 4th century. And this one? Mm, well, the same thing suggests 2nd century. So once Stuart's finished recording, can we pull him off from here and get him helping Phil? Sure, close it down. Cheer Phil up. I think that does that. <laughs> The walls in Trench 5 tell the story of a key moment in the villa's history, when the original house was extended to reflect its owner's increasing wealth and status. But even before the extension, this villa was on a pretty massive scale, if the remains in Trench 4 are anything to go by. Have you managed to crack it? Do we understand what's going on? I think we know what's going on now. I'm stood in a, a, big, a big room, and there's a wall on one side, down here, and over by Kerry is the back wall. Where's your wall, Kerry? It's running across the trench this way. So, so is that the full width of the wall? It is. It's about uh, just over a metre wide. That's a big wall. Presumably that means they're exterior walls. No, no, we're in a room in the building. I'm sure what this means is we're actually talking about a two-storey building, you know, one metre wide walls. So perhaps what we've got is like almost like a very high central block, two metres high, perhaps then with sort of single style porticos on either side. That's extraordinary because for two and a half days I've been assuming that we've got three rooms like barracks. Yeah, I mean, these are big, tall buildings. Yeah, you know, these are country houses. So what's this bit here? Well, I think I'm actually stood inside an earlier phase of building. I think We've got a wall here at right angles, the corner of a building, and I'm stood inside it. So maybe this could even be a sort of a single-storey house which is replaced by a two-storey house. What about this stuff here? Could just be a very narrow slot that held a timber beam, and that might even point towards a timber building. So it might have gone old timber building, first stone building, 
Two floor building. Yeah. Three phases. The family who lived in this early house were almost certainly local Celts. But judging by the scale of the place, they knew a thing or two about how to get on in Rome and Britain. The right decision to make for a Celtic tribal person early in the Roman period, when they come down here, is to side with the Romans, because then the Romans will give you a position in the local town council. Right. You get on that gravy train, you've got a slice of the action, because the way they work was to hand power back to the people who were already here. You exploit the existing hierarchy, so long as those people are prepared to play the game the Roman way. These people did really well out of that. He did so well out of it, he was able to pay for expanding his house to accommodate his growing family and all the support staff and servants that went with it, on condition they did it the Roman way. It's nearly the end of day two, and we're working frantically to uncover as much as we can about the villa. We'd like to pursue the possible gatehouse in John's geophysics. Unfortunately, we simply haven't got the labor but there's still plenty to go for in the West Range, where we're uncovering more evidence of how classy this place really was. Oh, Bridget, that's gorgeous. This here is a piece of ceiling plaster. How can you tell that? Well, we can tell that because we seem to have, we've got this octagon shape here, yeah. and this is not found at all on the walls, it's always found on the ceiling. And also inside, we've got what looks to be a stylized bird with a tail. Why have we left this whole mess here? Because the mosaic does actually go under it, doesn't it? It does, but across most of the mosaic, there was this very compacted rubble demolition layer that was put down on top of the mosaic after occupation. Presumably this tells us about what was going on before the mosaic was laid. This is particularly interesting because this is almost certainly an earlier floor and it's been painted with what we call blue frit, which frit. is a powdered glass. And it's going underneath the, the bedding for the mosaic itself. So we've got two floors, period one, period two. And can you tell anything about this floor? Well, because it's blue frit, I suspect that it could be the floor of a bathhouse. Changing a bathhouse to a dining room is quite a radical rethink. Even the villa's west wing didn't escape this family's appetite for home improvement. This came out in the last half hour or so. It's a fourth century Roman brooch. It's probably the nicest find that I've seen on this site. In fact, it's virtually the only find that I've seen on this site because we've been so spoiled by the structural archaeology that we've virtually ignored the bag loads of finds in that tent, all the finds that are being cleaned over here. We've got three, four trays of finds here. We've got another three associated with this trench. In fact, we've got finds over the whole site. And tomorrow, we're going to look at them in much closer detail to see if they can tell us more about the actual lives of the people who lived in that beautiful room nearly 2,000 years ago. Join us after the break. It's the beginning of day three in our quest to uncover the huge Roman villa at Dinnington in Somerset. So far, we've concentrated our efforts in the west and north ranges of the villa. But today, in the east range, we've opened a new trench, where Bridget thinks she may have found a Roman kitchen. Hi, Bridget. What you got? Hey, what we've got here, we've got this creamy mortar layer here, sure. which is coming out of the bulk, and it comes down here, and you've got these really, you know, very distinct edges. And we're coming down here, and it keeps going down, and I think these are the base, this is the mortar, that was the foundation for a wall around a flue. So what's the flue filled up with? Well, the flue is filled up with all this burning. There's loads of charcoal, loads of slate, bits of fallen in, really burnt right. stone. Any other finds, Bridget? Yeah, we do. We've got this pot here, which oh. is quite domestic looking. That's nice. This is a South Somerset storage jar with a kind of pie crust rim. But look, it hardly curves at all. Mm because yeah. the actual top of the jar is about that wide. So this is a big storage jar, suggests so kitchen, suggests so storage. OK. We've also got this Samian. Oh, right. This is 4th century AD. This is tableware. This is what right. you'd be picking your grapes out of or drinking your wine. So this is... This, is, this, this and this don't really go together, because this is dining room, that's kitchen. 
So I guess our trench would go one of either way, really. Over in the West Range, Phil's still not getting things his own way. He wants to dig deeper into the archaeology, but he's been asked to expand Trench 3 instead because geophys reckon they've found evidence of a bathhouse. No sign of that so far, just more pottery. Now, all right. Yeah, this is a black burnish rear cooking pot. Can you see, Phil, that the rim's quite crooked over? In the early Roman period, the rims are virtually upright. As it goes through time, the rim goes further and further over. So this is quite a crooked one, so that means? It's a, it's a late one. Right. Good date indicator, then. Yeah, fourth century, that goes to the Oxfordshire pot. Great. Good find. Pottery like Phil's is an excellent way of dating the archaeology. And you'd think that the vast quantity of other material we've been turning up ought to tell us a lot more about life in the villa. But it's not quite as simple as that. Well, the trouble is that although we've got stacks and stacks of finds, the vast majority of them are actually bits of the building rather than the things used inside the building. But we have got some interesting bits. Recognise that? Samian? Gordish Samian, that's right. Imported wine cup. The great thing about that is you see the profile and the line around the edge. That means it's a type from the early 2nd century. Imported, used in our early house on the site. So this is right back from the, the early days of our occupation here, wine drinking. But these are bits of beakers from later on in the 3rd and 4th century. This is really beautiful. I love the look of that. But this is for beer drinking, a more Celtic British type of habit. But something I want to show you. It's the base of another beaker. You see the finger marks there and there? That's where the potter has held it to dip it into the slip. It's a real reminder, this is a handmade world. It's not a machine-made world. They put up with the kind of imperfections that we wouldn't accept. We've got to remember that the Romans thought of pottery in a different way to us. Um, it, it wasn't as special to them. They used pottery and then chuck it away when it's finished with. So that's why there's so much in Roman sites. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. but not in this one. What we've got here is we've got bits of rubbish being left, but we haven't got any of the good stuff. Yeah, the pretty clear picture we're getting is that this is a place that was systematically demolished and cleared. So why did they do that? I mean, it could be political upheaval. The land could have changed hands. But if you've moved out, you've been told to move out because you've been told to leave the country or something, you take everything that's valuable to you out of the house. That's what's happened here. We'll never know what forced the family to abandon their villa. Maybe it was political upheaval. Maybe a more personal crisis. But whatever the cause, it must have been hard to say goodbye to a home as magnificent as this. Phil's finally started to get deeper in Trench 3, and he's got his reward with a first glimpse of some masonry. What a great decision to go down. That looks superb. Well, I mean, this is a serious wall. Absolutely serious wall. I mean, looking at it, look, there's a, look, there's a step in it. Look, you've got a step there, and then a little plinth, and then that one in the next one there in the sequence, and you've got another little plinth there. So what's, what do you think is, it, is in between the two? I mean, is, are we looking at, what have we got, a doorway, or do we have, what do we have? No, I think that's all been robbed out. It's been robbed out. What I can't understand, still can't understand, is why we've had to come down quite so far to get it. Yeah. It's a hell of a way down. Either we're into very, very deep foundations that have been robbed out, or we're into a, a terrace. Yeah, I mean, they're, certainly, I'm just, they're certainly big enough to be sort of foundation oh, stones, though, aren't they? These are, these are, these are serious, these are serious stones. And if they were quarrying out bits of stone this big yeah. and moving them in from a quarry, no matter how far away, that's a big undertaking. Huge undertaking, the masonry in Phil's trench almost certainly came from a quarry here at Ham Hill, just a few miles away from our site. But some of the other building materials used in the villa could only have come from much further afield. Neil, I've been looking at the material that's coming out of the site in terms of sort of really how the site was built, how it's provisioned and how material came into it. So it's our site here is the red square and you can see some of the materials actually could have been got hold of very locally, the limestone and the mortar to actually bed the mosaics in. But other of the stuff has come from really quite a long way away. We've got the lead um, the nearest sources charter house up there, roof stone up at Pensford near Bath, the slate um, from Exmoor. So it's a huge area really is being exploited to build the villa, a lot of money going into that. And although we don't know that these are Roman quarries as such, the evidence has all gone, um, they are the nearest sources. And if we take off the supply lines and then put the Roman roads on... Oh, right, look at that. 
it really looks quite convincing, doesn't it? Because all these sources, with the exception of that one, but all of the rest of them are all sort of straight up or down the Roman roads. Sure. I mean, it's also quite interesting, isn't it? This is a big agricultural area. You know, this villa's got its status and wealth from agriculture. And look, you know, going down the Fossway, you could be taking your produce out to a port at Seaton on the south coast, and from there along the south coast towards London, or maybe even across the Channel to Gaul. But equally, this is an important route because it's a very important Roman port here on the River Parrot, and that would then give you access to the western seaways around Wales, maybe even up as far as Hadrian's Wall. So, in fact, our villa at Dinnington has massive sort of local and mm. international contacts, really. We're nearing the end of day three, and the race is on to mine as much information as possible from this huge site. Even Trudy, the landowner's daughter, has been roped in to help. Meanwhile, there's trouble cooking at the other end of the site. In Trench 6, Bridget thought she'd found the villa's kitchen, but now a rival theory has emerged. David and I are just discussing what's going on, and we've come to a disagreement. My warning bells are ringing here, Neil, oh. because I'm wondering if, in fact, what we're looking at is a grub hut. A grub hut? Well, we, we have to investigate, to be sure. So we're saying we've got an Anglo-Saxon house with a sunken basement, and this is what you're saying might be the figure. Might be. Which is later than the villa, yep. dug into the ruins of the villa. If David's right, and these are the remains of a later Anglo-Saxon house sitting on top of the villa, you'd expect the walls to continue in this direction and form a rectangle. Bridget's not entirely convinced. I just don't think there's any justification that, that you, we can even consider this a grub hut at the moment. I mean, I don't even think that this is the shape I mean, of a grub hut. I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding of a grub hut is that it is a rectangular, standard rectangular... Well, th this is rectangular. Well, I don't see that. I do not see this as a rectangular feature. I'm, I'm not convinced by the grub hut, David, I have to say. No, but we need to know that it isn't one before yes. we go down it, into it vigorously. Let's just see if we can trace this edge again. If it is a rectangular structure, well, OK, I might buy a grub hut. They're very rare in the West Country. That will make it even more important. You've done a great job in here for two days, Bridget. Let's not ruin it now. Let's keep it nice and focused. Two hours, good luck. So, lots still to do in Trench 6. But in the West Range, we're starting to close down trenches. In Trench 2, we've found this wonderful patterned mosaic, the floor of the villa's summer dining room. In Trench 1, we found the fragments of an even finer figured mosaic that would have graced the heated floor of the winter dining room. We've also revealed two walls which enclosed a tiled floor. It's been badly damaged by ploughing, but there's enough left for us to reconstruct what it might have looked like in the 4th century. An impressive corridor which ran the entire length of the West Wing, linking the most important rooms in this grand villa including the one Phil's been racing to uncover in Trench 3. Phil, yesterday oh. afternoon you started saying to me, I want to get down, I want to get down. <laughs> well, you've gone down. Was it worth it? Totally justified, Tony, absolutely. I mean, this is probably one of the most crucial pieces of evidence we've actually got because it tells us so much about the structure of the villa. From this wall, the sheer size of it, this is sufficient to say that, without a doubt, it was a two-storey villa. What are these bits of stone here? The, these are all part of the wall. Well, I think, actually, where I'm standing is where these similar blocks have actually just been robbed out, and the two bits on either side are just bits that have been left in. Yeah. So, the, actually, what we've got is the foundation. Quite incredible. And we've got the turn of it as well. That's right. That's right. So, pretty much, this is the end of the villa and then it's going to start turning off and going that way. So you chose the right strategy? Totally vindicated. Guy, what can we actually say about what the building here was like now we've just about finished work? Well, we know from what we've geophased and what we've excavated here that this was a really enormously substantial house. There are around a thousand villas or more known in Roman Britain, but this is one of the top 20, so oh, it's a wow. really important country mm. house, yeah. Brilliant. And we know from what we've found that it was very plushly decorated. One of the most exciting and exceptional things we've got here is this lovely piece of wall plaster. And it's not just a simple one colour panel, this is a much more complicated sequence of decoration. You can see this decorative border here, 
So what would have been in here? Would there have been a picture? Maybe in a mythological scene or maybe a rural scene, the kind of thing that Romans loved, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. And what sort of date range have we got on the material now? Well, the pottery, we've got some pieces that start in the 2nd century and the bulk of what we found is 4th century. Uh, we've got some very well-dated pottery from the 4th century and also a lot of 4th century coins as well. We've got some jewellery that the women might have been wearing to show off their wealth as well. We have, yeah. We've got this lovely penannula brooch which has come oh. out with 4th century pottery, so pretty sure by relative dating that it is of the same date. Brilliant. Well, I think that's absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much. It's nearly the end of day three, and our picture of this monumental site's almost complete. But not quite. The diggers in Trench 3 don't look ready to hang up their trowels just yet. And oh, look. my God, <laughs> no. It's, yeah, it is. Uh, it, it's not a fragment. It's, it's, oh, fantastic. Looks like I'll have to keep an eye on those two. And in Trench 6, there's still one unanswered question. Has Bridget found the evidence she needs to prove this was a Roman kitchen? But we've found it. We've got an oven. It's an oven? It's an oven, oh, definitely. Good. I'm really sorry. No, it's good. No, it's it's good. really good news. Yeah. It's really nice. What we've got here, we've got this flue coming in down here, and on the base of it, we've got this clay, and it's been heat-affected, heat and that's why it's the white colour it is. And then we're inside the oven, so we were on the upper deposits of the mm, oven, oven and the charcoal, right, you know, previously. Yeah. The inside of the oven then continues out along here and then it comes back in and you can see it. It's dark on this side, yellow here, and it comes down to here where we've got the corner here. The oven's going to have had a dome on it, yeah. gone out of use, collapsed in, so you've got all this building debris. Well, it's, it's, it's good to, for it that it's been resolved, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, and what it says yeah. to me is, you know, we, we've, we've proved here we've got an oven that suggests cooking easy food preparation Absolutely. isn't it so it's a domestic area and i guess it dates to very late roman period from the finds but yep. you know that's great we you know in two hours we've actually resolved that problem you're happy david i'm very happy now we've we've resolved exactly what it is nearly two thousand years ago a celtic family chose this fertile plot of land to build their farm it started as a humble one-story building but as the family's fortunes grew, so the building expanded. Until by the fourth century, it covered an area of more than 100 square metres. And at the heart of this display of wealth and power were the wonderful mosaics with which they adorned their grandest rooms. You know that thing about waiting for a bus for ages and then three come along at once? Well, just as we were about to go home, this came up. Is it what I think it is? Yeah, fantastic mosaic. David, is this mosaic as good as the one we've already found here? Oh, far better quality. Wow. We're looking at really high quality workmanship here. I imagine roughly 300, AD 300. I mean, it really is a high status pavement. I don't think Trudy's field has seen its last archaeologist. This fantastic last-minute discovery is at least three foot deeper than any of the other mosaics we've found here. It looks like underneath the really lavish building we've spent the last three days uncovering, there's an even grander and better preserved villa just waiting to be discovered. All of which means that when this villa was at its peak, it wasn't just any old villa. This would have been one of the finest country houses in Roman Britain. Mm -hmm.